connections of structural steel members are of critical importance. An inadequate connection, which can be the weak link in a structure, has been the cause of numerous failures. Modern steel structures are connected by either welding or bolting, or a combination of both. In considering the behavior of different types of connections, it is convenient to categorize them according to the type of loading. The tension member splices shown in figures A and B subject the fasteners to forces that tend to shear the shank of the fastener. Similarly, the weld shown in figure C must resist shearing forces. The connection of a bracket to a column flange, as in figure D, whether by fasteners or welds, subjects the connection to shear when loaded as shown. The hanger connection shown in figure E puts the fasteners in tension. This tension is often magnified by bending in the connected part and is called prying action. The connection shown in figure F produces both tension in the upper row of fasteners and shear in all bolts. Welds are weak in shear and are usually assumed to fail in shear regardless of the direction of loading. Once the force per fastener or force per unit length of weld has been determined, it is a simple matter to evaluate the adequacy of the connection. This determination is the basis for the two major categories of connections. If the line of action of the resultant force to be resisted passes through the center of gravity of the connection, each part of the connection is assumed to resist an equal share of the load, and the connection is called a simple connection. In such connections illustrated in figure A, B, and C, each fastener or each unit length of weld will resist an equal amount of force. The load capacity of the connection can then be found by multiplying the capacity of each fastener or inch of weld by the total number of fasteners or the total length of weld. This video is part of a series devoted to simple connections. Eccentrically loaded connections covered in future videos are those in which the line of action of the load does not act through the center of gravity of the connection. The connections shown in these figures are of this type. In these cases, the load is not resisted equally by each fastener or each segment of weld, and the determination of the distribution of the load is the complicating factor in the design of this type of connection. Before considering the strength of specific grades of bolts, we need to examine the various modes of failure that are possible in connections with fasteners subjected to shear. There are two broad categories of failure, failure of the fastener and failure of the parts being connected. Failure of the fastener can be assumed to occur as shown. The average shearing stress, in this case, will be the force P divided by the shear area of the bolt. Although the loading in this case is not perfectly concentric, the eccentricity is small and can be neglected. In double shear, an analysis of free body diagrams of portions of the fastener shank shows that each cross-sectional area is subjected to half the total load, or equivalently, two cross-sections are effective in resisting the total load. The addition of more thicknesses of material to the connection will increase the number of shear planes and further reduce the load on each plane. However, that will also increase the length of the fastener and could subject it to bending. Other modes of failure in shear connections involve failure of the parts being connected and fall into two general categories. The first being failure resulting from excessive tension, shear, or bending in the parts being connected. If a tension member is being connected, tension in both the gross area and the effective net area must be investigated. The corresponding strengths are shown below. Please be aware that the two connected elements might have different yield and ultimate strengths, and thus, each of the bottom equations must be used on both the connecting elements. Here I show an example where one of the elements 
is made of A992 steel and the other of A36 steel. Depending on the configuration of the connection, block shear might also need to be considered. The design of a tension member connection will usually be done in parallel with the design of the member itself because the two processes are interdependent. The block shear failure is comprised of two components, shear and tension. The shear strength will be the less of yielding and rupture and for tension it will just be a rupture. This makes the total strength of the connection in block shear as follows. The factor UBS is equal to 1 when the tension stress is uniform, such as in angles, gusset plates, and most coped beams, and equal to 0 0.5 when the tension stress is non-uniform. Also note that A sub N is the net area and A sub G is the gross area. The second category is failure of the connected part because of bearing exerted by the fasteners. If the hole is slightly larger than the fastener and the fastener is assumed to be placed loosely in the hole, contact between the fastener and the connected part will exist over approximately half the circumference of the fastener when a load is applied. This condition is illustrated here. The stress will vary from a maximum at A to zero at B. For simplicity, an average stress computed as the applied force divided by the projected area of contact is used. Thus, the bearing stress would be computed as P divided by D times T, where P is the force applied by the fastener, D is the fastener diameter, and T is the thickness of the parts subjected to the bearing. Of course, here both parts are subjected to the bearing, and thus, the part with the lower strength governs. A possible failure mode resulting from excessive bearing is shear tear out at the end of a connected element, as shown in figure A. If the failure surface is idealized as shown in figure B, the failure load on one of the two surfaces is equal to the shear fracture stress times the shear area. The tear out can take place in either of the connected parts either at the edges or between the bolts. In addition to tear out, failure can occur by excessive elongation of the hole. The failure load is proportional to the projected bolt bearing area times the rupture stress, resulting in a nominal strength of a constant C multiplied by the bearing area multiplied by the ultimate strength of the weaker connected part. If excessive deformation at surface load is a concern, and it usually is, C is taken as 2.4. This value corresponds to a hole elongation of about 1 over 4 inches. Although both bearing and tear out limit states result from bearing, the AISC specification classifies them as follows. So, the elongation criteria is simply called bearing and shear tear out due to excessive bearing is simply called tear out and they are evaluated as shown. For load and resistance factor design, the resistance factor is 0.75 and the design strength is then 0.75 R sub N. This is a figure that illustrates the distance L sub C. When computing the bearing strength for a bolt, use the distance from that bolt to the adjacent bolt or edge in the direction of the bearing load on the connected part. For the case shown, the bearing load would be on the left side of each hole. Thus, the strength for bolt 1 is calculated with L sub C measured to the edge of bolt 2. And the strength for bolt 2 is calculated with L sub C measured to the edge of the connected part. AISC equations J3-6A and J3-6C are valid for standard, oversized, short-slotted and long-slotted holes with the slot parallel to the load. When computing the distance L sub C, use the actual hole diameter 
and do not add the 1 over 16th inch as required in AISC for computing the net area for tension and shear. In other words, use a hole diameter of H is equal to the ball diameter D plus 1 over 16th of an inch for standard hole size or 1 over 8 inches for oversized holes. But for the calculation of the effective area in tension, there is an extra deducted 1 over 16 inches shown in green required by the AISC for the limit state of tensile rupture. To maintain clearances between bolt nuts and to provide room for wrench sockets, AISC J3.4 requires that center-to-center -center spacing of fasteners in any direction be no less than 2 and 2 thirds times the bolt diameter and preferably no less than 3 times the bolt diameter, where D is the fastener diameter. Minimum edge distances in any direction measured from the center of the hole are given in AISC table J3.4 as a function of bolt size. Stay tuned for part 2. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.